speaker seminars. This is what we call the Lunchbox Speaker Seminar Series, where we can take an hour between 11 and 12 Mountain Time uh, as we're available. Our schedule does fluctuate about around my travel at times, around industry uh, speakers availability, and but also around student schedule. So like our uh, spring break, I don't hold these seminars on midterms and finals weeks. But I am going to make this a regular series so I can bring you, uh, my students, more information from industry and from academia. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen before I introduce our speaker. I'll try to do this each, each time we have one of these series. Uh, I am transcribing, so if you do think you need that or you want to invite someone who needs that, let me know because I see it transcribing on my side. So I want to make sure that uh, you know that that's available for somebody who needs that accessibility. So welcome again, the SSCC Controlled Environment Agriculture Lunchbox Series. Uh, I have speakers lined up. I've got a schedule here. And as said early, uh, Pedro is the second speaker. Joe Pate, a good friend of ours, a friend of our program, was the first speaker last week or two weeks ago. And Pedro stepped in today last minute and I'm very glad he did because often our students don't get to hear the story about Pedro's climb to success with aquaponics. Uh, most of you know Pedro from SFCC as the lead greenhouse tech. Uh, he had a whole life before that, so he was very successful in the Caribbean. And if it wasn't for a horrible, catastrophic uh, hurricane event that he'll probably mention here in this talk, he'd probably still be doing uh, what he was doing. Um, so he's here now. He owns a business with me and AB as well, High Desert Aquaponics. We can do consulting out of that business if anybody needs help. Uh, they have more time for that right now. I work with students so much that it's mostly AB and Pedro uh, getting into some consulting, but he is available. I hope he mentions that during this talk. And you see the other speakers here that are coming. My students know Damon Seawright and Americulture as our tilapia fingerling supplier. Uh, they supply most of the U.S., I would say, as well with tilapia and into Canada as well. Uh, Dr. Tidwell is an inspiration for me at Kentucky State University, so we're going to be hearing about their, their programs and maybe he'll inspire students to get into aquaculture, which is one of the fastest, it is the fastest growing sector of all of agriculture. And Rosanna Salanave is New Mexico State University Extension Aquatic Ecology Specialist. She's famous because she works with me. She uh, publishes with me and she works in the aquaponic area. So as her name applies aquatic ecology, as anybody in the state who has questions about hydroponic growing, aquaponic growing, or what I like to say water farming or farming in water, uh, we're gonna connect there. Uh, and then Justin Henry, I'll mention a little bit further who he is, but he's from Canada and he's going to be our last speaker for this semester. OK. And uh, some events that are coming up, Indoor AgCon. I want to bring these up every time that we meet here because they come and go and new things happen all the time. So the Indoor AgCon is the end of February, early March. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to make that meeting, but that is the go to meeting if you're a student interested in getting into indoor ag, which includes greenhouse cultivation and they're partnering with the National Growers Association. And if you've never been to a big Vegas convention, this is the one to go to if you're into lighting and hydroponic systems and uh, floriculture to food culture. So it's a great event. Aquaculture America is one I have been involved in in almost 30 years. So it is the aquaculture meeting of the US and sometimes it's a triennial where they combine with the world aquaculture as well. So it's very academia. I'm going to pull up in class next week in the lab uh, what it looks like to go to a conference like that where you have about 12 concurrent sessions. So there's 12 rooms from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. of sessions of speakers giving talks. So obviously I'll be giving a talk out there when I go on SFCC and what we're doing in the world of workforce training, controlled environment, agriculture, technology uh, in, in those areas. So on and on, I'll keep mentioning these as they come up a little closer. Cultivate is out in Ohio, another big indoor and greenhouse grow conference. I've been working this week with a group called NCERA 101 or hearing more about it and talking to the chair. It's a group out of uh, USDA that is a committee 
designed to focus on controlled environment agriculture. And that committee is made up of ARS, agriculture research stations across the US, and they're bringing in the, the technology research results to one committee under USDA, and they're gonna meet out in Tucson. It's a great place to network with the best uh, higher institutions of knowledge. So I'll probably try to make it out there and let them know that we are providing the pathway of students. So all of my students are gonna have opportunities to get into these big schools. Schools like you've heard of already, uh, University of Arizona, Cornell, Michigan State, Utah State, and some of the names that you've heard of as well. Uh, so look forward to in class, we'll be talking more about that. And the big one that comes up in our program is the Aquaponic Association. We've always been part of that association. We sponsor that usually. We buy a school pass, which gets our students scholarships to attend or at least virtually attend. And this year it'll be back um, on ground in Oklahoma City, as well as a virtual component. So we'll certainly be taking part in that again. OK, the last thing I want to say before I introduce our speaker is there was big news this week before the meeting started and we started recording. I asked my students, did anything come up? And I'm going to try to just jump away for a second and see if I can uh, if anybody's in the lobby waiting to be let in. It seemed like I'm getting some notices. And if you all get a notice like that, that people are waiting to be let in, please go ahead and accept them while I'm talking or a speaker's talking. OK, I've been Let's doing it. OK, great. Thank you, Pedro. So wrapping this up here, a new announcement. USDA just came out with their first federal advisory committee on urban agriculture. OK, these are the names here on the left, and this committee is uh, put together to be a support system and a network for urban agriculture. And so a lot of what we do in controlled environment agriculture fits the key words for urban agriculture and CEA. Uh, CEA really is designed. So we've talked about these things in class. In urban environments, we're seeing a huge trend towards rooftop farming. And there's a third name down there, Viraj Puri. He's an innovative producer. Uh, he is the founder, one of the founders of Gotham Greens. And many of you have talked about Gotham Greens in your current events, and you know about this huge trend uh, to go uh, on rooftops, and they're spreading across the US. The other one that you should know is Cabin Smallwood, and he's an aquaponic grower, and he has a business called Symbiotic Aquaponics. And we have one of their systems. When you first walk into the student section at the college, you'll see one of their systems that they donated. So congratulations to both of those people because now on this very small network of support, uh, we have hydroponics and aquaponics very well represented. Both of these people are very outspoken in support of recycle hydroponics systems in controlled environment uh, agriculture settings. So that to me was exciting. I was nominated for this board with about four other people in the aquaponic world by the Aquaponic Association, and it looks like they did grab one of us, and that was our intention to make sure that we had some standing uh, in aquaponics, and I'm glad we also see hydroponics represented there. So now what I want to do is open the lunchbox. That's uh, kind of the plan here. We'll take 10 minutes to catch up with everybody. Uh, then we'll have a 40 minute speaker at that time. We're going to go off recording and I'm going to let my students just have some one on one time with the speakers at the end of these series and they will be available on YouTube coming up shortly. OK, so I will stop sharing mine, Pedro. I'll let you introduce yourself and I'll let you uh, share your own screen. OK, OK. Hi, everyone. <laughs> For all of you that don't know me or have not seen me before, because I know some of you have not, I'm Pedro Casas from Puerto Rico. Um, my background, I have a bachelor's degree in fine arts, major in graphic design and minor in photography. I did publicity for 10 years, and after that, I got involved into the agricultural world. Um, I went to get trained at the UVI, one of the last five day training with Dr. James Rakosi. After that, I got trained by Murray Hallam, an Australian guy and another, another group of ex experts around. And then I became a farmer and a teacher of the aquaponic process while my farm was running. Um, so that's a little bit of my history. Um, I've been in the aquaponic industry now about 10, almost 12 years, I think. <clears throat> um, when I started, there wasn't any classes or 
colleges that you could go to and get trained by, for aquaponics. The only place was the UVI and Puerto Rico. You're going to see in my presentation. There's a. It's very close to, to the UVI. So it was a, a very easy jump for me to go and, and get trained there. So I don't want to take much of the time presenting myself. I want to show you what I used to be doing. And if I get the presentation quick enough, I also have a little video at the end that I want to show you because this winter I went to Puerto Rico to fix and get a, a system of a client that I have there that is an aquaponic system, but it's one of the few aquaponic systems that I have been able to put DWCs, uh, gravel beds, wicking beds, and all together in one system. So it's one water running, one pump moving everything and running different types of aquaponics in the same loop. So let me share my screen. That hey. looks great. If you want to try to big it up a little bit bigger, you can. That's as big as I can. OK, great. OK, guys, so that's how my farm looked at the end of the uh, of before the hurricane hit it. But let me go a little bit by little bit on, on the process. What I'm going to talk about, you guys, is a where's Puerto Rico, a history of the farm, why aquaponics in the island, issues when you don't have a greenhouse, uh, renovations for better results, and what happens to a, a farm or a, a, an aquaponic farm when when gets hit by a bad hurricane. Um, that's where Puerto Rico is in the Caribbean. So you can see a little bit of Florida right up on the top, um, but it's a tiny island. And uh, San Croix is one of those tiny islands on the right uh, on, on the right of Puerto Rico. You almost can't see it, but it's right next to us. So uh, that's how. That's where aquaponic basically started uh, with Dr. James Okosi and Charlie was there for 16 years, I think it was. <clears throat> so, uh, and that's Puerto Rico. Uh, it's 100 miles by uh, 35, the island. So it's a tiny island and where the star is, is where I had the farm. It was a little bit up in the mountains. I didn't want to be too close to the, to the ocean because of the salt. Uh, so uh, we were able to get it up in a in, in a side of a mountain. So you'll see some of the photos on, on how everything started. So March 2012, the farm was a very similar design to the UVI. Uh, the UVI did not have a greenhouse, so we went the same way, thinking that we were going to be able to do the same. And this is one of those examples that I would say, never go and do whatever someone else is doing. Microclimates are something very important to know. Um, UVI, even though it's next to us, doesn't have rivers, doesn't have a lot of fresh water, so there's less impact with pests than what we get in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, we get rain almost every week. We have over 75 rivers that crosses through the island, so there's a lot of water, and when there's fresh water, there's a lot of insects. So that's one of the issues that with this uh, lecture I'll be talking about, that you always have to design your, your, your greenhouse and your farm depending on your uh, climates. Uh, the only difference between our system was that uh, instead of four fish tanks like UVI was doing, we did two bigger fish tanks, and it was all because of the space that we had. Um, it was a little harder for us to get four tanks going in there as big as we needed it, so it was based on design. Um, I know you guys have seen probably this uh, graphic of UVI, um, how the UVI system was. We had almost the same thing, but the four rearing tanks, we had two big, bigger tanks than those four. So it was very similar to the amount of water that we were running uh, for the UVI type system. That's how UVI uh, had his unit, their unit. And this is how was my area, my our fish area. So we had two big fish tanks. And you can see here that we did everything with very recycled or reusable materials. We bought pools for the fish tanks. We used tanks, um, uh, cistern tanks. and. IBC tanks for filters and all that. So we we just made it happen. We try to go with the cheapest uh, ways of building a system. And sometimes that's not the best way to go. Most of the times you have to think about all the things that you need to have to make sure your farm can run for lots of years. Uh, when you do this kind of systems, you're going to start having issues, problems, and leaks, and, and you know, pipes that breaks, uh, tanks that don't last long. And it's going to be a, an investment later on that you have to always get into the into the into your into your business. That's uh, when the system was acclimating. <clears throat> Water was 
just flowing around, getting the bacteria going, like you guys have learned, um, getting that ammonia uh, build up uh, so we can get the nitrites and nitrates happening. Um, uh, this is when we started our first crops and our first uh, uh, lettuces and tomatoes and basil, uh, chives. Uh, if you can see how the lettuce looks, it ha it's like a conveyor belt. You got smaller plants at the beginning, a little bigger and a little bigger on the on the process. And that's basically what you guys are going to be seeing soon in the aquaponics here at school. Because uh, it's the little cycles that we're going to do. These are more commercial cycles. We're going to do smaller ones, but it's the same thing. Um, there you see how I had to do some trellis for the tomatoes. The tomato foam boards don't move. The lettuce foam boards will push them out all the way to the end to be able to, be, to harvest at the end. <clears throat> so why we did aquaponics in Puerto Rico, there's a lot of good things. It's a year round growing cycle outdoors. So we could do a lot of growing outdoors year round. We don't get cold. So our weather, it's good year round to produce whatever we wanted it to produce. We have a lot of rain so we can conserve water. We we were collecting water all, all the time that we were getting rainwater and all the water that we were replenishing to the system was rainwater. Uh, we could do different types of greens and fruits in, the, in, in our climate and we needed it to produce more local organic production. Uh, people would think that Puerto Rico, because it's an island and it's in the Caribbean, can, you know, we, that we, could, we are producing a lot, but we import 89% of the food that we consume. So really Puerto Rico is not producing enough. If we compare it to New Mexico, I think New Mexico produces or imports 96% of what we consume. So New Mexico and Puerto Rico are very close in how much we import food. So yes, I believe that any business that comes up on, on food production in this kind of places, it's it's a business that we're going to flourish. So that's a, a far view of the farm. And you can see the, the prettiness of how the lettuce look. Uh, the smaller ones and the middle ones and the bigger ones. On the last bed at the end, we had the basil cycle. We had some of those tomatoes growing on the middle and at the beginning, but that's how the farm used to look um, without the greenhouse. And we had a lot of issues uh, by not having a greenhouse. And you're going to be seeing soon some of those because I have a bunch of photos. But that's our basil plants, uh, uh, Genovese basil, sweet basil. Um, we were producing about 80 pounds of basil weekly. Um, those were our green lettuces. We were doing Tropicana and, and um, Coastal Star. I believe Amanda is doing the Coastal Star here in the NFTs. But that's how they look in the aquaponics. Tropicanas. Some of our tomatoes, some of the chives. Um, down there you can see the cycles of the lettuces. So yeah, the farm was doing incredible. Um, aquaponic does incredibly for this kind of crops. Um, you always have to try to find the, that niche market and you always try to have to find what sells in your area. People think, oh, I'm gonna do lettuce or I'm gonna do basil. Well, you, you make sure you have who buys those kind of products in your area because you can be the best basil producer but if you don't have a lot of uh, clients to buy it, you're going to be composting a lot of basil. Um, that's one of the few times that Charlie went to visit uh, the farm. That's my brother who I started the farm with. It was a family business. It was my father, my brother and I who ran it. We had a few employees helping us, but um, it was a farm. It was a family farm business. Um, what were the no greenhouse issues, how I call them? Well, we had too much rain, something that we don't have here in Santa Fe. Um, we had ex extreme heat. We can do, we can get extreme heats in summer times here in Santa Fe. We had a lot of insects because of the amount of humidity and rain. We had fungi and PM problems. So that makes a farm have more maintenance. And all these things are the ones that you don't want. You want to try to maintain a farm as, with the less maintenance uh, possible with the net so you don't spend that much money. But if you don't have a greenhouse in a climate like ours or in a climate like here in Santa Fe, Puerto Rico is because of the heat. Santa Fe is mostly because of the cold weathers uh, and some of the heat weathers or the hot weathers. So, you know, we gotta, you gotta think about that before you start a business as a farmer. Uh, what were the problems? 
a lot of caterpillars, a lot of rain. If you see that photo on the bottom on the right, the pathways were full of water. And if you imagine trying to walk around after the rain passes, everything gets humid, everything gets extremely wet, and fungi and mildews are starting to show up in all kinds of ways. So it's, 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 it was not easy. <clears throat> um, that's what happened with tomatoes. They get full of caterpillars. Even though we were spraying two or three times a week, it was exposed to the weather. It was exposed to the outdoors. So everything was coming into the plants and getting them uh, eaten up. We were having caterpillars that eat the leaves. We were having caterpillars that eat the tomatoes. We were having all kinds of insects. And it was a little hard to control that without having a, a, a greenhouse. Tomato hornworm. Sometimes we'll get a, a big rain in the morning. Midday, we get a sun up to 90 degrees. And ha that's what the lettuces will look like. They dehydrate it. Even though they were on water, they couldn't resist the amount of heat, the amount of water that they got on and the amount of heat right after. So there's a lot of things that greenhouses help on your crops to for you to be able to produce and have a constant production weekly. If you think about this, that was the lettuces that were ready, but the whole bed was dead and I lost four weeks of my cycles. So I lost four weeks of production. So four weeks of cash flow that the farm wasn't getting in. And those are the little things that sometimes when you're a farmer or, or when you want to become a farmer, you don't think about little things like this can damage your business big time because you're losing produce that are not making money, but you are putting the time and the money to make that product growth. <clears throat> all the different mildews that I got from the from mints to lettuces and basil, all the types of mildews showed up because of the amount of, of, of humidity. <clears throat> Mealy box. So I got uh, involved with some people around in the island and asked them about uh, how do I get a greenhouse going with a system already in place. So I didn't do a very, very good research and this company from the island recommended me a greenhouse that at the end of the process, I found out that it wasn't the best one for it, but it did help us in some time of the, of the season. So we built this low greenhouse in a hot place. It's not something that you should do. But in winter times and not in summer times, we were able to do very good on the crops. We were able to start some other types of crops that we were uh, experimenting with, like the kale and different types of lettuces. Amaranth, that's my daughter helping me with the lettuce. Different mesclum mixes, other types of tomatoes. <clears throat> um, so the farm started, you know, producing a little better with but uh, summer times, that low greenhouse became, you know, a place where nobody could have been in there, even the lettuces. From producing 48 to 60, uh, 52 to 60 cases of lettuce a week on summertime because of the heat and how hot the greenhouse got, we went down to like four or five cases because the lettuce didn't like the heat and the water got too hot and all that. So we started... Uh, learning that we didn't do the best greenhouse for the kind of climate that we had in the in the island so we did a, a bigger renovation on 2015 we had a help from the government in the island uh, the agriculture department had a um a loan a kind of a, a loan kind of thing for for farmers and we were able to get some money to help us get our greenhouses higher and by this time I got more involved into the designing because it was my it's my background. So I got involved in learning how to do three dimensional uh, drawings. And I really got into getting my farm to produce to triplicate production was my goal. So with the same amount of growing spaces or maybe a little more because we put a couple more beds to grow uh, a little bigger than what the UBI system was. But I was uh, focusing on producing two to three times more in that same space. So we came up with the idea of A-frames. <clears throat> so we started building um, with the money that the government gave us that we were able to invest in the, in, the, in the farm. We started getting the greenhouse 22 feet high instead of eight feet high like we had it, because that way we can dissipate the heat inside better and make it move out of the greenhouse faster. 
We also did a different top design on that greenhouse where we had a mesh on that little opening on the top. Let me see if I have another photo. I think I have another photo later on so I can explain it better, but it, it was easy to get the hot air up to the top of that greenhouse. And on that little venting area, it was the, the air that will move in and out from outside will push, will pull out the air, the hot air from the greenhouse. So we were able to control better our temperatures on the inside. And that way I was able to do A-frames to triplicate production on most of my bits. And you'll see some of these. These are some of the um, uh, renovations that we had to do to create a two more beds, uh, two more uh, UVI uh, DWC beds. There you can see more of our uh, cistern tanks to collect rainwater. Uh, on the bottom, you can see that we did the fish tanks this time on concrete under the ground, four feet under, so we can manage temperatures better when you have um, concrete and, and water underground. It keeps temperatures uh, better than if, if they're exposed to the ambient. Um, that's the guys uh, working hard on the process. We were creating a big concrete wall to hold the, the the mountain on the side so we could uh, expand a little more on the on the growing space. Those were the fish tanks. <clears throat> this time we separated the UVI system into four separated units. And that was just a situation in the island that because of uh, issues that we could have in different crops, we were able to separate if one system got bad, we could you know, shut that system off, do a nice cleanup and start over and not shut the whole system. So we had four different systems running apart. And that's how uh, the farm started uh, looking uh, on the on the fish tank area, uh, expanding down there the two extra beds. So we, we had eight UVI type uh, DWC beds. Um, one of the big changes was that I didn't have a clarifying tank. I, I integrated my clarification process in that filter box that we designed it. Um, so basically the water was running from the fish tank to that big filter box and then from the filter box to a, a small degassing tank and then going to the to the beds. Um, that's how the greenhouse look on the inside. We had to do some more supports to make it uh, strong enough for the height and the winds and so here you see the top of what I was talking about. So now the little sidewalls on that top are a mesh. Metal is on the top so we could collect the water that was uh, getting there from the rain. And then all that um, was uh, moving the hot air out of the greenhouse very easily. And that's how uh, everything was looking. All the containers that you see, one, the, one of the containers was my office. The other container was the seedling area. We had a control environment, seedling area. You'll see some photos in it. And the other one, the other container, the red one, you'll see later how it got a little more prettier. It became our packaging and distribution container where we will, you know, bring everything in there, pack it, get it ready, and then take it out in the van and distribute it. Um, and here is a little bit of what our A-frames were. Basically, I was able to do what one panel does an eight by four flat. I was able to do three panels in an A-frame on that same footprint. So I was basically almost triplicating production on this process in a same DWC uh, system. The issue with this was that we needed it to sprinkle the water on inside of these A-frames and we had to design another way of how to move the water to these A-frames. Uh, we did have to get some more, uh, another water pump to be able to do this, but because of the amount of production that we were able to maximize, it will, it was okay for, for us to spend that energy on the pumps to produce this amount of crops. So in the A-frames, that's um, on the left, we were doing a watercress, on the right, that's pak choy. We did a lot of testing on different pak choys and, and, and mint, and then, one of the crops that we really uh, made it work was the mint because Puerto Rico, there's a lot of bars and they like um, drinking a lot. So the mojitos was one of the things that people liked a lot. So we were basically producing most of the mint for most of the bars in the island. We were doing about 300 pounds a week of, of mint uh, 
and we were able to do that because of the A-frames. If I would have been doing mint on the flat raft like regular, I I, I didn't have the space to, to, you know, to produce more. Um, this is my ceiling container. So it had an air conditioner on the inside because I would, needed it to control temperatures. Uh, Puerto Rico, the temperature gets too hot, so I had to go a little uh, colder for my water to move around my seedlings and be able to have a, a good seedling process. So everything run in here after three weeks, everything will go outside in the aquaponic beds and then it'll go into the container for the packaging. Um, that's how six or five of my beds look with the A-frames. We still had some of the other ones flat for basil and some other plants that would do better on raft than on the A-frames. Not every crop will do good on A-frames. And, you know, that's something that I will have to say. Uh, we try basil and we try some other ones that never got as big as they could get if, if you have them floating in the water. Um, we were working with a with a fish guy in the island that was growing catfish, a pangasius type uh, catfish. And also he was growing tilapias for us, the red Nile and the regular um, Nile tilapia. But these are some examples of what we were doing and what fish we were growing in the island. All my mentors and all the people that helped me since I started, uh, Charlie there and the other guy next to me is uh, the fish guy in Puerto Rico. Um, down on the bottom, it's Murray Hallam, the Australian guy, and on the top, there's a couple of the guys in Puerto Rico that helped us make things happen. Um, so this is the crew that I'm still in touch with and still uh, talk to them a lot. And it's it's something that you, you will enjoy in this industry. People will stay in touch. Um, we did solar panels in, in uh, the, the last two years of the of the of the farm because it was part of the money that we got from the from the government um, we were able to put about 95 panels solar panels and that only covered about 35 to 40 percent of our energy costs so energy in the island is super expensive and it's something that we all have to think about uh, it's the same thing that happened here to the dome that I was mentioning earlier of a, of a client of us here you know the dome spending a lot of energy on, on keeping it hot and those are things that we need to calculate before we start a business to make sure you know you're going to be able to make the enough money on produce to be able to cover your your energy costs and this is a, a little of a sad part i'm going to go a little quick so i can uh, have five minutes for the video but uh this is what happened when a hurricane goes and i've been reading about some companies saying that they have um, hurricane proof greenhouses and hurricane proof windmills and things like that when you're in a hurricane, um, sometimes those kind of things don't don't make sense. Um, there's a short uh, video there that I don't want to put because it's long, but it's just the, the way going to my farm and that these are the same, but in photos. So it was the road going to my farm. So it took me about five days to be able to reach my farm because I needed it to clear off the road before I was able to get there. Um, when I get when I got there, that's what I found. Um, everything got completely destroyed. The mountain on the side, the, the con concrete wall that we did uh, broke. Everything broke into the farm, landslides. Everything just got destroyed. And after six days of not having power and not having anything and having this destruction, obviously, um, that's what happened with the fish tanks. Having 800 tilapias on each tank is not a good sight when you when you get there and you lose power and you lose everything to maintain these animals alive. <clears throat> and that's it, guys, on this lecture. Let me go. So now, let me talk to you a little bit. I, I have this client in Culebra. I have a. Uh, 10 more minutes about. Yeah. I have this client in Culebra. Um, he went to my farm maybe six years ago and he had a somebody, and I don't want to say from any place because I don't want to talk bad about nobody, but somebody designed a, a very bad um, aquaponic system and he came up to my farm saying that um, some people have told him that I could fix aquaponic systems 
And he's like, I'm going to give you a chance to see if you can fix my system. If not, I'm going to destroy it. And then I went to the farm and he had a beautiful place, uh, 14 acres in Culebra. It's an incredible island. And, um, and let me show you real quick how things look now. So you just stopped sharing, right? Now you're going to share a video? Yeah. I'm going to share okay. the video. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. That's great. Oh, the so I'm walking where the aquaponic system is. This is a 14-acre farm. He has horses. He has cows. He makes milk out of the cows and cheese and all that kind of thing. He he He's... He produces most of the, the things that he needs for eating when he's living here. So we have cows, we have goats, we have chickens, he have his own uh, uh, eggs. And this is the, the last part of the system that I built. The two first beds that you see there are uh, gravel beds. They're wicking uh, um, ebb and flow types, those two. And those two, the, when, when the ebb and flow drains, it drains on the bottom of those two wicking beds that get filled up and keeps the soil. This is a soil bed that is getting uh, mixed up again and getting ready. Um, so they're fitting it up with soil, so the organic soil, so this aquaponic water is wicking up on the soil so they can do carrots and, you know, uh, ginger and turmeric and potatoes, but they're putting all kinds of crops because it's doing inc incredible. They have all kinds of basil, they were doing some uh, carrots, they were doing some eggplants. Um, they just told me that they cleaned it up um, not long ago. Tomato plants were reaching the roof. So, and all that water is coming from the main and one aquaponic system that is this one that you're seeing here. It's uh, three DWC beds where he's growing it only for lettuce, for mixed greens. And then he has four, three fish tanks. And at the end, he has a... a a four tank that it was uh, our filter but I was there because he needed it to change the filter and those matalapas got bad and it was very expensive to get new ones so we decided to eliminate that filter and then we got into this little room that I also designed for him his seedling area and his you know storage and we installed that filter over there that big uh, bubble bead filter so he could use that other tank that he was using as a filter uh as another fish tank so he has in this little room air conditioner also because he has to control temperature he has a uh, 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 tanks to grow uh, fingerlings and, sh and small tilapias get them big enough so he can start uh, keep them uh, going back into the big fish tanks to get the aquaponic going <clears throat> um let me see <clears throat> if i can share real quick I don't think I can share that. I thought I had a, a photo of how it looked before I was there, but I don't have it. <laughs> so if you stop sharing now, uh, Pedro, because yeah, I think your team's is sharing. I just wonder before we get into Q&A, can you talk a little bit about marketing and what it took down there and how you sustain? Because as we talk about in class, you look around the US and there's not a lot of successful aquaponic farms that are supporting themselves or maybe a small family, um, challenges of fish and plant marketing. Can you speak on that for a little bit? Oh, yes. Um, it, growing greens is not a market that will make you a lot of money unless you have a huge farm or unless you have a, a production. So one of the big things we we first did, it was, it was a, a, a marketing of research. We went around we started looking at restaurants, we started looking at bars, we started looking at all kinds of businesses and what they were buying, how much they were getting, what was the cost, how was the price coming in different uh, times of the season because it's imported. So we had to do a very big uh, research uh, on the marketing part to be able to, to find sales. Uh, we never grew no, we never. We did grow some things that were not pre-sold, but most of the times, everything that we started cycles, it was pre-sold, and we needed it to do it that way. The only thing that happened is that, um, the other thing that happened was that small farms don't do this uh, 
um, marketing research and, and sales research. And we had so many other farmers that we had to get together to help each other and sell all the produces because, uh, you know, small farmers like a one UBI system is a very small farm. And if you really want to make money, you got to find a way to, you know, to get that um, production going. If you lose a production, you need to have a backup. And if you don't have that backup with another farm that can back you up with some of your lettuce, um, you might lose those clients. So it's a hard business to be in. But if you really do the study, if you really do the research, and if you really get into what you need to do to make it happen, it works. Um, it, 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 if you don't think about it since the beginning, if you don't write a business plan, if you don't do things beforehand, it can it can take a toll on your business. <clears throat> Pedro, I know I, I'm not trying to get into Q and A yet. I'd like to keep you on just for a couple more minutes. Okay. Uh, one, if you if you could follow up on that with uh, any uh, thoughts on organic certification with your farm, and did you go down that road? But also, then if you could just finish up with what's the future? Uh, what do you think the future is with CEA and hydroponics and aquaponics that you specialize in now? Um. What was the first question? My bad, Charlie. Uh, organic certification. Oh, in Puerto Rico, yeah, we try to go to the route of organic, but um, we knew aquaponic was organic enough that we just uh, started labeling our product or uh, aquaponics, and we kind of like did some explanation on the labels to for the people to understand what we were doing. Sometimes the um, USDA organic label is too expensive for a small business like ours, and we weren't getting less paid to our produce because of it so we didn't have the issue of becoming you know usda organic or not uh, nowadays i think depending on where you are in what state there's there's much more com competitive farms that might have you know the usda organic label and all that and some businesses might require that uh, i don't think all businesses are requiring that you sell organic produces so it, it all depends on your area and your business on about the CEA and hydroponics and aquaponics that I'm doing now, I believe that control environment is the way to go. Um, uh, hydroponics and aquaponics, I think we sh in business types, we should mix them all together. I think just going aquaponic or just going hydro or just going soil is not the smartest way to do farming nowadays. And I do believe that the, having a, a control environment, aquaponics, hydroponics, and even soil growing can help one. One can help another one depend on, on how you do the cycling and the rotate on, rotation of crops. So um, I do believe that agriculture has to go mostly into control environment for us to be able to feed the world. That's great. And Pedro, you've been a part of it for a long time. When I was uh, inviting people here, it, just from our institution, I realized how many friends you have, and I see some guests who are here as well. So what I'm going to do, and the way this works, everybody, I'll stop recording here, and we'll see the next speaker in a couple of weeks. So we showed the, the schedule earlier in class, and then we'll take some time and do some Q&A. So Pedro, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for doing this so our students can learn a little bit from uh, some failures. You obviously weren't 100% successful in nope. how you produced and you were you were able to change and to come up with new techniques. So I think that's really what helps our students learn is from our mistakes. You and I have been doing this for a long time. So uh, I'm going to stop recording everybody, but you can stick around.